In Switzerland, they were trying to decide where to locate a nuclear waste site. No community wants one in its backyard. But they identified a town in the mountains, a small town, as the likeliest place. The residents, though, had to agree. A survey was done before the final decision was made, asking the residents, if the parliament chooses your town, will you accept the nuclear waste site? 51% said yes. Then they asked a follow-up question. They sweetened the deal. They said, suppose the parliament chooses your town and votes to allocate a financial compensation to each resident of the town yearly of up to $8,000. Then would you approve? Now how many do you think were willing to accept it? What would you guess? How many? 80? 70? 90? Lower. Someone says lower. Lower? It was lower. The willingness dropped from 51% in half to 25. Now, from the stamp. What's that? That wouldn't happen in Britain, you say. <laughs> Here, what would it be, 90%? You think so? Well, here's an interesting question. From the standpoint of standard economic models, this is a paradox. If you offer people money to do something, their willingness to do it goes up, not down. So what happened here? What do you suppose happened? What? What was it? So now the risk, they have a heightened sense of yes, the risk. Exactly, because it's worth 8,000 8, euros. 8,000 euros must really be awful, dangerous, <laughs> yeah. worse than I thought. Yeah. That's one hypothesis. Yeah, too much. What? It was too much. It was too much. It was a bribe. A bribe? What? The, the, by putting this price, they felt that it was too cheap a price. So too for, cheap a price. Yeah. All right, so there are two hypotheses here. <laughs> One is, maybe the, the, they've reasoned, they're willing to pay 8,000 euros, it must really be riskier than we thought. But they tested for this, and it turns out that the estimate of the risk by the population was the same in the first, uh, before and after the monetary offer. So it turns out, though it's, it's a plausible hypothesis, that that was not, did not explain the difference. What did seem to explain the difference is a point some others have suggested. They asked people, why did you change your mind? And they said, we didn't want to be bribed. Mm -hmm. See, before, the 51% were willing to undertake this sacrifice for the sake of the common good, as a sense, out of a sense of public responsibility. We need the energy, the waste has to go somewhere, this is the safest place, we'll accept it. But then when they're offered money, what had been a matter of civic virtue becomes a financial transaction. And they said, we're not willing to endanger our families for 8,000 euros if it's a financial transaction. So in the Swiss town, it seems, the monetary incentive had the effect of crowding out, displacing, corrupting, the sense of civic duty, public responsibility. In Israel, there were some daycare centers with a familiar problem. Parents coming late to pick up their children, nurseries. So with the help of some economists, they tried to solve the problem by imposing a fine for late arrivals. What do you suppose happened? There were more late arrivals. Now, wh why did this happen? What? Right. Well, yeah, people have, have called it out. Before when people came late, see, the, the monetary fine was treated by the parents as a fee. 
And before when they got, arrived late, they felt guilty. They were imposing an inconvenience on the teachers. They were violating an obligation to show up on time. But once there is what they regard to be a fee, they're paying for a service. So why feel guilty? You don't feel guilty when you hire a babysitter to look after your child. It was like paying a, a babysitting fee. So here again, the introduction of a cash incentive dissolved or crowded out the sense of obligation to show up. And what's interesting and telling is that when they saw what happened, they removed the fine, but the high level of late arrivals persisted, <laughs> which suggests that once you erode a sense of responsibility, a mutual responsibility in a common purpose, it's not so easy simply to turn it back on again once you erode the ethos. Well, what do we learn from these cases? I think what we learn is, is this. In order to decide where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong, we have to do more than ask about economic efficiency and how incentives will work. We also have to ask about whether introducing money into a certain practice will dissolve or displace or crowd out goods, attitudes, norms, values worth caring about. And this carries a consequence for the way we think about markets and the role of markets in public life generally. During the past three decades, when markets and market mechanisms and the faith in market reasoning have reached into most every sphere of life, we've had very little public debate about where markets belong and where they may crowd out important non-market values. In Iraq and Afghanistan, there were more paid military contractors than there were US military troops. Now, this was not because there was ever an explicit public debate whether we wanted to outsource war to private military companies. It happened. And in many areas of public life and personal life, markets and market mechanisms are playing a greater and greater role. And the argument of the book is we need to step back and deliberate together, to reason together in public about hard value judgments, the kind that Alistair worries about are making. Because it's true, what we can't avoid is to have a deliberate public debate. Now, the reason it's hard is that we don't all agree on the meaning of goods. We don't all agree on the, on the proper way of valuing health and the intrinsic goods that it may or may not involve. We don't all agree on how to value education or how to go about teaching and learning. We don't all agree, to go back to the cash for sterilization example, on how to value the reproductive capacity of women. These are controversial questions. And we tend to shy away from them in our public debate because we're worried, I think, understandably, about disagreement. But unless we confront directly these questions, unless we find our way to a morally more robust public discourse, these questions will not go undecided. Markets will decide these questions for us. I'd just like to end with a small story. We've been talking about some large social institutions, health, education, military, criminal justice system, prisons, about the difficulty of translating all values, all goods, into a single uniform measure of value, namely money. I spent four years in Britain as a graduate student. I was a graduate student in Oxford in the mid and late 70s. 
And in those days, they still had all men's, some all men's and all women's colleges. They weren't all mixed. And in the all women's colleges, they had rules against overnight male guests. These rules were rarely enforced by then and easily violated. <laughs> or so I was told. <laughs> Pressure was growing to relax these rules at St. Anne's College, which was one of the all women's colleges. In, in my day. And there were those who were opposed, those who wanted to retain the traditional rules on traditional moral grounds. But times had changed, and they were embarrassed to give the, the true reason for their objection. So they translated their argument into utilitarian terms, into monetary terms. They said, if we allow overnight male guests, the costs to the college will increase. <laughs> How? How, you might wonder? Well, they'll want to take baths, and that'll use up hot water, they said. <laughs> Furthermore, they argued, we'll have to replace the mattresses more often. <laughs> Monetary arguments. The reformers met those objections by offering the following compromise. Each St. Anne's woman could have a maximum of three overnight male visitors each week, <laughs> provided he, he paid 50 pence to defray the costs to the college. The next day, the headline in The Guardian read, St. Anne's Girls, 50 pence a night, <laughs> which shows the folly of trying to translate all goods into monetary terms. Thank you very much. <laughs>